Now I'll move to the topic of consistency models, which is always a very confusing topic and people tend to confuse cache coherence and consistency models. So it's really important to understand the difference between the two. So cache coherence, and you know, we looked at snooping based and directory based cache coherence, and what that guarantees you are these two conditions. The first is write propagation, which says that when I make a change, everyone is eventually going to see that change. And the second condition is write serialization, which says that for a given variable, if I'm making two changes to it, so let's say that you're writing to memory location A, and you first write the value 5 into that location, and then sometime later you write the value 7 into that memory location. So what write serialization says is that everybody is going to see the writes to A in exactly the same order. So everyone is first going to see the write of 5 into A, followed by the write of 7 into A. The consistency model goes beyond that. So the exact meaning of consistency models will be made apparent to you in the next few slides. So at a high level, you can say that if I were to write 5 into A and 7 into B, you can see that the cache coherence protocol makes no guarantees about how these two writes are going to be seen. Right. So this is where the consistency model kind of comes in. Okay. So let's look at an example to finally understand what a consistency model is. So let's say that you are a programmer and you are writing a piece of code and there is a certain region of code where you realize that only one thread should be making a change to certain variables at a time. Right? So that's your critical section and you're trying to ensure mutual exclusion when executing the critical section. That means when one thread executes the critical section, you don't want any other threads to be executing the critical section. Right? And we just saw an example of how you would use a lock to implement these critical sections. But let's say that you, for some reason, decided that a lock was too expensive and you want to do it without using locks. So you come up with this clever algorithm that implements critical sections, and that's what I'm showing you on this slide. So the first thread executing on processor P1 first sets A to B1, and this is me expressing my desire to get into the critical section. Then I check to see if B equals 0 or 1. Right. So I'm checking to see if the other thread is also trying to get into the critical section. So in a symmetric manner, the other thread sets B equals 1 to express its intent to get into the critical section. And then it checks to see if the other thread is also trying to get into the critical section. Okay. And if the other thread is not trying to get into the critical section, then it is safe for you to execute that critical section. Okay, so normally if this check fails, you would loop back and try again. Okay, but you know, let's just let's just stick with this example over here. Okay, so with this code, if you stare at it for a few minutes, you can convince yourself that this should work correctly, right? It is impossible for both threads to be executing the critical section at the same time, right? So you have been able to implement mutual exclusion and you've done this without using locks, right? So you feel pretty happy that, that you came up with this clever algorithm and you were able to do this. And so you take this program and then you run it on, say, a multi-core processor. And let's say that the processors are equipped with out-of-order execution. So when you do that, it turns out that your program actually does not behave correctly. Both threads are able to execute the critical section at the same time. So why does that happen? So on an out-of-order processor, the first processor or, or the first core in that, in that multi-processor brings in this program into the core, so it brings it into the instruction fetch queue, then renames and places it into the reorder buffer, the issue queue, and so on. And then you're going to check for dependencies, and instructions that are not dependent on previous instructions can all execute together. So you look at this instruction here, it's looking at the value of B. There's no previous instruction that looks at the value of B, so there is no data dependence, and so it's perfectly safe to execute this instruction right out of the gates. And similarly, the second out-of-order processor brings the second program into its reorder buffer, issue queue, and so on, checks for dependencies, and this instruction again has no dependencies and can be the first instruction to execute. Right? So those two instructions are selected for execution right away, and they get to examine the value of A and B even before the previous instructions have completed. Right? So even before the writes to A and B have been performed, you can go ahead and execute other instructions. You can even execute instructions in the critical section. Right? And when you check the values of A and B, they turn out to be zero. And so both threads assume it is safe to enter the critical section. And so these instructions are executed and eventually committed. Okay, so this is clearly the incorrect behavior, right? This is not the behavior that the programmer intended. And the fact that my hardware does out of our execution, the fact that it reorders all of these memory accesses, that is what leads to incorrect results. Okay, so clearly,
there is more to this puzzle over here, right? Just having cash coherence is not enough. Okay, so when you looked at this program and said it should behave correctly, you were making a few assumptions, right? And you were making a few assumptions that were natural and intuitive for you. And those assumptions are referred to as a sequentially consistent model. And those assumptions can, can essentially be broken up into three different subconditions. The first one says that within a program or within a thread, you are assuming program order. Right? So we all assume that when you look at a thread, the first instruction is going to execute first, then the second, then the third, and so on. Right? So we always assume that there is program order being preserved within a thread. Right? And that's why when we said that if this instruction has executed, then for sure the value of A has been set to 1. The second assumption we made is that each instruction executes atomically. And that means that when you execute one instruction, it's almost as if that's the only thing running in the system and all other processors are in a state of suspension and waiting for this instruction to finish. This makes it easier for me to reason about the program because while I'm thinking about A equals 1, I don't have to reason about what all the other 100 processors are doing. Right? So we assume that one instruction starts, finishes, then the next instruction starts, finishes, and so on. The third assumption we made is that each of these threads can progress at different speeds. And that results in an arbitrary interleaving of instructions. Okay, which and you know it's 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 easy to see why this assumption comes about because you know some thread may have a branch mispredict, some thread may have a cache miss, and so it's hard to predict beforehand how fast each of these threads is going to run. Okay, so uh, if this instruction is the first to execute, it's possible that the next instruction to execute could be this one here. It's possible that the third instruction to execute could be from the same thread, right? And so the interleaving could be arbitrary. And this is based on whether individual instructions are slower or faster. Okay, so in our minds, when we were thinking about the results of this program, these were the assumptions that we all implicitly made. And that's referred to as the very intuitive, sequentially consistent model. Okay, but it turns out that the hardware that we ran this program on was not sequentially consistent. It was doing arbitrary reorderings of instructions. And because of that, this first condition was being violated. And that's why the results were different from what we had assumed. Okay, so these reorderings are typically safe in a single thread setting, but they turn out to be very unsafe in a multi-thread setting. Okay, so this isn't good news, right? This basically says that I worked so hard to introduce out of order execution, and now I seemingly have to turn those off so that my multi-threaded programs behave the way they're supposed to behave. Right? So I can't have you know, an easy programming model and high performance at the same time. So that seems like an unfortunate result to, to come up with at the very end of this course. But it actually turns out that you can have it both ways. You can actually get an easy programming model and you can have high performance both at the same time. So let's see how that is accomplished. So the reason that this program ended up behaving badly on our out of order processor is because it had a race condition and when you have a race condition, right, so you can see that, you know, both of these sections of code are touching A and B, and at least one of these threads is modifying A and B. And because of that race condition, when you do reorderings over here, you end up with surprising results. Okay, so an easy way to deal with this is to say that, you know, if I look at my code, and if I identify a critical section over here that has a race, what I should be doing is very carefully encapsulating that inside a lock, right? That's what I did on in the previous video, where I said that when you access a critical section, make sure you acquire a lock, make sure that you are the only one executing this code, then release the lock and let other threads get in, right? So as a programmer, it's a very good practice to identify these racy pieces of code, acquire a lock before that, and then release the lock. So if you do that, you can avoid multiple threads accessing the variables at the same time. You need one additional piece of support from the hardware, right? So if the hardware is performing out of our execution, if I'm executing all of these instructions and reordering them in arbitrary ways, it is incorrect for me to start executing these instructions before I've acquired the lock. If I did that, then I would get the same surprising results that I got in my previous example. Okay, so the hardware should recognize that when it sees special instructions like locks and unlocks, those should be treated as what are called fence instructions. And when it sees a fence instructions, it should say that, you know, let me wait for the fence to complete fully, then let me look beyond it. 
right? So when I'm reordering these instructions all over the place, I should make sure that I don't also execute these instructions at the same time, these instructions beyond the fence. Once I've acquired the lock, then it's safe for me to look at these instructions and reorder them in arbitrary ways. Okay, and then finally when I execute the unlock, then it's safe for me to look at these instructions and reorder them in arbitrary ways, right? So for the most part, you are using out of order execution, right? So these instructions over here enjoy out of order execution. These instructions over here enjoy out of order execution and likewise down here. But you're making sure that you're never mixing the instructions that, that, that straddle these fences. Okay, so with this in place, we now have a hardware that gives you high performance and you have a programming model that is very intuitive for the programmer to reason about, right? So when you write a program in this way, you know exactly how it's going to behave. You know that you're going to acquire a lock and you'll be the only one in the critical section. You release the lock and then somebody else takes over and you're making sure that an instruction is executed only after the lock has been acquired. Okay, so this gives you both high performance and an intuitive programming model. Okay, so the hardware that supports this kind of model is, is supporting what is referred to as a relaxed consistency model. And then the programmer chips in by making sure that they annotate the code correctly with appropriate locks and unlocks. And then things become much easier. Okay, so just to kind of recap what we've discussed here, we said that if you don't use locks, if you just have races in your code, and if you're trying to reason about behavior, we are always assuming what is referred to as a sequentially consistent model. And in our minds, we are making you know three different assumptions. Now, if you run that program on hardware, which is not sequentially consistent, you're going to get surprising results. And most modern pieces of hardware are not sequentially consistent because they do arbitrary reorderings to get higher performance. Okay, so we still want to keep that high performance, so we still want to allow those reorderings. But then we introduce this notion of a fence which says that I'm going to do reorderings, but I will limit my reorderings in certain circumstances. And that makes that leads to a programming model that is much easier for the programmer to deal with. All the programmer has to do is when they get into critical sections, they introduce appropriate fence instructions. And that makes it easier for the programmer to reason about the program and also have the hardware not do arbitrary reorderings beyond those fences. Okay, so make sure you watch this video a couple of times because this is a complicated topic. And here's a slide that just kind of summarizes what I just uh, described as well.